A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, part 14, pages 67 through 71. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Think of that! Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name. And yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-room house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire, until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What, eh, what has ever got your precious father then, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother Tiny Tim and Martha weren't as late last Christmas day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah, there's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless you. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes, darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church, and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day! Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house, that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. "'And how did little Tim behave?' asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. "'As good as gold,' said Bob, and better. "'Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much "'and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. "'He told me, coming home, "'that he hoped the people saw him in the church "'because he was a cripple, "'and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day "'who made lame beggars walk and blind men see.'
Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to a stool before the fire, while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a, jug, in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. To simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was very some it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, and Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the beast, but when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet every one had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got all over the wall of the backyard and stolen it. While they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid, all sorts of horrors were supposed to be continued. <laughs>